our questions. Okay, so I'm going to go through this first section. So this first section is going to be getting started with Azure. So we want to introduce us to Azure. I believe that most of people, they are familiar with Azure, and I know a lot of people are familiar with um, the cloud. So we'll be starting with... Um, from Hello, uh, hello, Paul. I think we lost you. Hello, if you can hear, if you can hear me. I'm not sure if you can hear you. Good evening, everyone. Hello, Paul. Yes, Paul. Can you uh, connect back? Please speak up. We cannot hear you clearly. Yeah, yeah, sorry guys. I, I guess I guess he's having some um, connection issues. So uh we hope to have him come back. I think he just left the call. I guess it's internet issues. I will suggest this most careful of the fight I didn't get that. I said I'm suggesting can you see a Something to amplify your food, your voice through a speaker. I got this with this speaker. Okay, so we um, hope to have him back and I'll speak up for I think Mark Rogers said. That's what he said. So let's just be quick. Come back. Sorry, sir, we can barely hear you. I think before we get start, I will advise we do mute on entry. So first won't be disturbing from the back. End. Okay, okay. That's that, that's a good suggestion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Hello? Okay. okay, so, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, okay so, you I, I said, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yes, so, yes. what the happened was... People are talking was, to me, hello, who is speaking? Hello, 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 can you hear me? Oh, 
Hello, please. If you are not talking, please just mute your mic, please. Okay, so basically we are we are um, on the um, feedback. So I was asking a question: uh, What do you guys expect? Um, basically, feedback on um, what you hope to see in this whole training and all. And let's 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 make sure to mute or mute um to mute your mic when you are not talking. So that would that would um stop us from hearing any background noise from you. So we just only hear whoever is speaking. It's very important. Please. For those that are just joining, so our speaker was on the Azure topic matter then and um, we had some small internet issues. So we had to leave the call. Hopefully you will join us as soon as possible. Hello? 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 Yeah, hello, hello. can hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, my internet had some little issue. I'm sorry about that. Uh, so let me continue. Uh, yes, okay. Can we still see my screen? No, we can't see. Can we still see my screen? Not yet. No, no. I'm resharing my screen again. I'm resharing my screen again. Yeah. So let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, I can see it. Okay, so we can continue then. So, like I said, we are getting started with Azure. So, basically, what we'll be talking about is going to be understanding the cloud platforms and the type of cloud services we have, the core Azure architectural components, and the Azure services and products. Uh, we'll be talking about the network connectivity in Azure and also security tools and features. Yeah, so these are going to be some of the basics of what we will be discussing um, on, in this in this section. And uh, hopefully during our subsequent sections with other uh, our most of our our speakers, they will be they will be deep diving more into some of these core. Um, objectives that I've stated here. I'm just going to be talking a little about some of these objectives. During uh, the time most of our speakers will be discussing, they'll be discussing more on most of all these things we've stated here. So I will appeal to most of us, us, all of us, that we shouldn't miss any of the sections because this is going to be very, very important for each and every one of us. Okay? Yeah, so now, what are the key components? Yeah. Yeah, I'm with this uh, session, yeah, will this session be recorded? For yeah, the section who... is is recording. Yeah, we're recording the section already. Okay, thank. Hello. Yes. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, I can uh, hear you. I yes. want to suggest. Uh, at the end of this section, can we have the slide? Yeah, this, yeah, sure, uh, the, no uh, problem. Video. Well, oh. as a file. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, so okay. now the key component for the cloud. Now, when we talk about the cloud, I believe everybody, one of us, have some little understanding when it comes to IT. I, I don't want to believe anyone doesn't have an IT experience on this call. So when we talk about IT, we know that it encompasses a lot of things. Um, when we talk about the infrastructure, for instance, you need to talk about servers, you need to talk about routers, you need to talk about switches, you need to talk about cables, you need to talk about a lot of things. The same thing for the developers, they need to talk about programming languages, they need to talk about uh, where to deploy the, 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 uh, the node they need to use, uh, they need to talk about a lot of LAMP applications for Linux applications or WAP applications especially for web uh, people that want to deploy a web application. And there are a lot of um, concepts it comes up when it comes to the traditional way of, um, of the IT services. But now coming to the cloud services, we discover that the cloud services add some great characteristics and consideration. 
and one of them is eye availability. There are three major cloud providers in the world, three major cloud providers in the world. One of them is AWS, the other one is Azure, and the third one is Google Cloud, which is GCP. And all of these things I've stated here, uh, it is, it, it, they are the characteristics of any cloud services. So which means that if you need to deploy any cloud services or use any cloud services, all of these things being stated here must be for any of your cloud services you are using. It must be a characteristics of any of the cloud services you are using. All cloud services must I have eye availability. And when I talk of, of eye availability, I'm talking about um, the services themselves must not go down. Um, in, in an instance whereby a person has one as a service is running, let's say for instance, a web application, for instance, it must never go down, right? And if you don't want the application to go down, the application is possibly running on a node, right? And if it's running on a node, you, you need to ensure that the node doesn't go down. Because if the node goes down, the services running will also go down, okay? So in the sense of the eye availability, it's, it, it, it is like you need to have more than one VM running. So that even when one VM goes down, the others can come up. Now, this is different from fault tolerance. It's different from fault tolerance. I'm going to come to that place. Now, when we talk of scalability, it means that it's easily scalable. You can easily go from one VM to two VMs, to three VMs, to four VMs, to five VMs. That is for the horizontal scaling. And when we talk about, you know, that, sorry, that's for the vertical scaling. When we talk about horizontal scaling, we are talking about increasing some resources. For instance, I can increase the disk size. I can increase the memory. I can increase um, the, 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 the RAM, the CPU. That is, that is scalability. You are making it scalable so that um, there won't be a lot of, when you have a lot of workloads running uh, on, on a virtual machine, for instance, they, they have enough capability to, to take your, your services, okay? Now, all these things is applicable. We can look at them all, but because of our time, I won't be able to go through all of them. All cloud services has the characteristics for elasticity, agility, fault tolerance, disaster recovery, global reach, security, customer latency, and cost and consideration. Now, any cloud services you are considering must have all these 10 characteristics. So if you have any um, cloud services you are looking at and working with, and it doesn't have any of these things or all of these things, um, I'm afraid it might not be the best cloud services, okay? Now, to the next slide. Now, there is something called the capital expenditure and the operational expenditure, okay? Now, I'm going to come, I'm going to speak in respect of when you have a server. Now, let's say, for instance, I have a general manager and he gave me a budget of 30 million naira to deploy a VM or to, to deploy a services, okay? And, um, you know, when you want to deploy services, let's say, for instance, I want to deploy a web app, for instance, uh, web app, you will need a server, right? You will need a network, you will need an internet, you will need a router, you need uh, a switch, for instance. All these things, when I'm buying them, they are capital expenditures. They are upfront costs. They are costs that you need to made, you need to, 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 to make even before having um, those, those things. Before, nobody can give me a switch without me giving the person the money first, right? I can get a, uh, a, a server, for instance, without paying for the server. That is a capital expenditure. And for capital expenditures, it's much more expensive because in that instance, you are, you are, you are buying resources. You are, you are. Now, the, 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 be, the best way I like explaining this is, take for instance, we make calls on our phones. I, I like using that uh, analogy to explain to people. Um, you want to make calls on your phone. Imagine you need to buy servers. You need to buy um, you need to buy infrastructure for you to make calls. That is capital expenditure. 
just imagine how much it will cost you to get a telecommunication um, um, gadget or infrastructure just to make calls. Those are capital expenditure. But when we talk about operational expenditure, these are you are spending based on the services you, you are you needed, which means that if um, I need a web app to run for 12 hours, I will be only paying for service for 12 hours. If I need service to run for six hours, I will only be paying for six hours. You understand? So in that instance, there are no upfront costs. I don't want to know uh, what happens behind um, the back, the back end. I don't want to know. Mine is this service should be available at this time. Look at it the same way as the telephone, um, the, the telephone billing system I, I talked about also. You don't want to know how MTN or Etisalat or Etel do, does at back end in their infrastructure. You just want to get a credit of 100 Naira or 200 Naira on your phone and make calls, right? Those are operational expenditure. And you discover that in that kind of model, it is way much um, cheaper than getting a capital expenditure, okay? Do we all understand? Yeah? Okay, now for the consumption-based model, like I've explained earlier, the pay as you go, uh, the operational expenditure, which is the OPEX, is more like you pay for the resources you are using. You are only paying for the resources you are using. You are not paying um, for all the resources. Imagine if you are having your server um, running in your server room, for instance. Even though you shut down your, your server and you went home, um, you, you went home after your day's work, you, get, you still get charged. You understand? Based on a lot of things, you get charged basically based on the power consumption your server is consuming, right? So, but in this instance, you are not charged. You are not charged for power. You are only charged for the services or the resources you are only using, okay? Now, there are three different kind of cloud models, right? We have the public cloud, we have the private cloud, and we have the hybrid cloud, okay? Now, for the public cloud, in that instance, you don't have no op uh, capex. It's the same thing I've explained about AWS, Azure, GCPs. These are public clouds. And you look when you look at public cloud, for instance, you can access them everywhere. In, in Azure, Azure have like close to 54 regions. AWS, I, I know they don't have any, re any infrastructure in Africa. They are mostly based in Europe and the US. So in that instance, they are public cloud because you can get your services in even in other countries. It's scaled through um, most of all these countries that you have. And you don't need to pay. You only pay for the services. You're not paying for servers. You're not paying for air condition. You're not paying for cooling. You're not paying for power those service, those um, those um, servers are consuming. You are only paying for the resources or the services you are using, okay? And when we talk of agility, agility is also part of it, okay? Now, the applications are easily accessible. The applications are easily accessible. When I click on portal.azure.com, for instance, I can easily access the application. If I have my application running on Azure, I can easily access those application. And if I stop using those application, I can easily deprovision this application. You understand? So these are things that public cloud can afford you. And it's a consumption-based model. You only pay for what you use. You only pay for what you use. You're not, you not paying. Hello, wait, what do I see your screen again? Hello? Hello? Hi. Hello? Can you see your screen again? Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Oh. And can, you. can you still see my screen? Okay. Good. No, okay, now, for, that is no, for the we public cloud. 
Okay, I can see your screen I think now. it should be coming up anytime soon. Okay, cool. Now, when we talk about public cloud, for instance, okay, like, like I explained, so public cloud, you only pay for what you use. If I'm using a VM for three hours, you will only be charged for three hours. Now, this is not only applicable to Azure, it's also applicable to AWS and also to GCPs and all other public clouds. Now, now we also have private clouds, okay? Now, private cloud, there are two major reasons why private cloud is good. In private cloud, you, which it means you have your servers running somewhere. You understand? You have your servers running somewhere, but not in your environment, okay? So let's say, for instance, we have a lot of private cloud companies in Nigeria now. One of them is main one, and another one is Rack Center. So I can choose to have my servers in, in main one, for instance. I can choose to have my servers in Rack Center, for instance. It's not in my locality. It's not in my office environment. My office can be in Ikeja, and I can have my servers or my, my servers in main one database in VI, for instance. You understand? Now, why will you use a private cloud? One of the reasons is you have control over your resources. You understand? I can go to the data center and point to where my server is. You understand? I can point that this is my server, even in the data center. You understand? And you can also, you have control over the security also. You can always, since you know where the offices is, you can always drive down to their offices and possibly want to check um, your servers. You understand? You, can, you have a lot of security. You can be rest assured that, yes, my servers are secured for the private cloud. But in that instance, based on what the private cloud companies are providing you, you might not have the ability for agility. You understand? The agility part might not be too, might not be there. And for the deprovisioning, uh, it possibly for some, you need to always go there, um, possibly every week to go and shut it down. Unless for people that have provided a VPN connectivity to you, and you could always always shut down from your offices. Okay? Um, can can we still hear me? Hello. Yes, we can, we can. Am I, yes, am I audible? We yes, we can hear yes. you clearly. Okay, can now for the... I can your screen. Okay, good. Now for the hybrid... Oh, okay. Can anyone see my screen? Yeah, yes. We can yeah. see. Some can see my screen, right? Yes, yes we can see your screen. Okay, now, okay, let me continue because uh, we are running out of time. I want us to be keeping to time um, during our section, okay? Now, for the hybrid cloud. Now, the hybrid cloud is a combination of the private cloud and the public cloud. Now, look at it in an instance whereby you have some resources in your private cloud and you have some in a public cloud. And I will tell you for, for sure, in Nigeria, this is the best approach Nigerians are using. So what Nigerians are mostly doing is they will have their servers running in the private cloud and use the public cloud as their backup. You understand? So when they use the public cloud as their backup, in, in, in an instance whereby the private cloud goes down, they can always go to the cloud to get their backup. You understand? When I talk of backup, I don't mean um, doing like backup, like you're having a replication of what you have on-prem in the cloud. So that if the on-prem is down, you can always spin up your servers in the cloud and it will look like there are no, uh, no data loss, no service lost, you understand? These are hybrid cloud. Now, what does it provide to you? It provides flexibility, you understand? Flexibility in the sense that you can run your application. We have some instances whereby some people will run their database in the public cloud and they will be running the front-end application in the uh, in the public cloud, sorry, and they have the database running in the private cloud. And especially for most banks, whereby they have policies that they can't take a data out of the country. So they rather have the database running in the public cloud, in the private cloud, for instance, and possibly have the application to the, that is the front end running in the public cloud. Now, when you have those kind of model, 
it means you are using an hybrid cloud. Okay. Now, what are the type of clouds we have? We have three major type of clouds. We have the infrastructure as a service. We have platform as a service and we have software as a service. Okay. Now, when we talk of infrastructure as a service, look at it like um, your computer, for instance. That is how I love to explain this. Look at your computer, for instance. There are a lot of major things that comprises your computer connecting, right? You need to have a storage. You need to have a network. You need to have power. You need to have, uh, what again? You need to have um, network. You need to have storage. And you need to have the comp you need to have the compute system itself. You understand? Now, when you have all these things, that is the infrastructure as a service. So you need you want to it's like you are renting, you are renting servers, you are renting VMs, you are renting storage, you are renting operating systems, for instance. So when you are renting either from Azure or from AWS or from GCP, you are doing you are doing the infrastructure as a service because you are more like you are renting these services. You are more like renting these services, okay? So Microsoft will give you some set of servers, VMs. So when you possibly go to the Azure portal, we are still going to demo this anyway. When you go to the Azure portal to deploy a VM, it's more like you are renting the server or you are renting the VM, okay? And it based on the number of hours you are using. So you are being charged for the numbers of hours you are using the infrastructure, okay? So when you shut down your VM, it means you are not charged for network, you are not charged for the operating system, you are not charged for the storage, you are not charged for anything, okay? That is for the infrastructure as a service, okay? Now, for the platform as a service, you will have Microsoft taking care of some things and you are taking care of some other things. Like I said, I look at it in the base of your system, okay? Now, let's say a developer, for instance, he didn't want to know um, how, I be, how I got my VM. He didn't want to know the number of VMs I deploys. He didn't want to possibly know the, the, the size of the VM I'm using. What he wants to do is he wants to come there, install his programming language, and um, start programming, start using his, um, start coding, and, and that is what he wants to do. So in that instance, he provisions some for Microsoft to do. Microsoft will do some parts, whereas the, um, the users too will do some parts. Now for the users or for the Microsoft, what they will do is they will take charge of the server, they will take charge of the networking, they will take charge of the database, uh, the data center for instance, and the operating system, okay? Those are what the Microsoft will be doing. And what would the developer be doing? The developer will decide on which um, um, programming language to use. Possibly you want to use .NET, or you want to use Python, or you want to use Ruby. You want to use any programming language. He can decide on the programming language he want to use and can start writing his code. He doesn't want to know um, which particular data center is connected to. He didn't want to possibly know uh, the public IP, unless if you want to make the public, uh, you want to um, um, bring the, the application to the public um, view and he needs a public IP um, for people to connect. Yes, he can ask for the public IP, but for some that don't want to, that don't care about that, they can always, uh, Microsoft can take care of all those things. What the developer needs to do is to come there and just write his code and his code is available for use. Okay. Now for software as a service, uh, we have Microsoft taking care of everything for you. It's they're taking care of everything for you from the infrastructure, everything. Now, what is gonna be the part for the, uh, the user? What the user needs to do is to create users, okay? create users, for instance, and start using the application. That's what it needs to do. Look at it in an instance of Office 365. For people that are familiar with Office 365, what do you need? You need license, okay? 
And when you have a license, what you just only need is to come there, create users. After creating users, you can start assigning license to people to use. Okay, that is software as a service. Okay, you can also have you have OneDrive, you have Dropbox, you have all sort of applications you can use. Okay, these are software as a service. Okay. Now these are comparison uh, based on the cloud services. We can look at them all together. The IIS is flexible. Um, I'm sorry about this slide. Uh, uh, I'm going to correct it um, before sharing this slide. The IIS, the IAAS, it is infrastructure as a service is flexible and you can control your VMs. When I say control your VMs, you can install update on your VM, okay? You can install antivirus on your VM. So you have control on your VM, right? Now for the pass, that it, it's more focused for application developers. So for people that develop application, they, 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 for, and for it to be globally available, uh, is recommended they use PaaS. And for software as a services, this is a pay-as-you-go pricing model whereby you are get charged based on the software de you deploy and based on the license you have on the software. So like I said, for instance, if I have Office 365, based on the license I have for Office 365, I can be able to use some resources uh, if my license can take care of that, okay? Now, this is an overview of the uh, responsibilities of all the management, okay? There are some parts that you need to take care. Now, for the on-premises, you are taking care of everything. You are taking care of your network, you are taking care of your storage, you are taking care of your server, your virtualization, your OS, your middleware, your runtime, your data, your application. You are the one taking care of everything when it comes to the on-premises, okay? Now, when we talk about infrastructure as a service, Microsoft is taking care of the node network. They are taking care of the node storage, which is the node itself. They are taking care of the server and the virtualization. You are only taking care of, from the OS level, down to the data and the application, you are the one taking care of them, okay? So which means that if I want to deploy a VM in the cloud, in Azure, for instance, Microsoft has taken care of the network storage server virtualization for me. Uh, what I will be, be having control over will be the OS. So I can decide which OS I want to use, whether it's going to be Windows or Linux, or I can even bring my own image to the cloud. You understand? So those are the capabilities you have for infrastructure as a service. Now, when we talk about platform as a service, Microsoft, which is the provider here, will take care of everything. What you just only need to take care of is your data and your application, okay? So when I talk of data and the application, the datas are your data themselves, okay? And the application is the application you intend to use. Either I need to use um, some application languages like uh, AWA, uh, sorry, .NET or C Sharp, for instance, or Python, okay? And I can code them. So these are for the platform as a service. Now for software as a service, Microsoft takes care of everything for you. What you just need is to get a license and you, begin to use the application, okay? Now, do we have any question before I go to the Azure um, architectural components? Yeah. So what I just described earlier was yeah. just a, um, a general knowledge about the cloud itself. But if you have any question, please, let's ask. Okay, let yeah. me ask Hello? Hello? Yeah, hello, yes. Yes. Okay. I don't know the modalities for asking questions so that we don't uh, jump on each other asking questions. Okay. I'm Emmanuel Adele. Can I go okay, ahead? Welcome, Emmanuel. All right. Yeah, um, sure. what, yes. Okay. While you were um, uh, delivering your uh, slides, and then you made mention of uh, the comparison between the three types of cloud computing that we have, talking about the uh, IAS, um, IA, uh, WAS, PWAS, and then SWAS. 
please, I need you to really yes. clarify. You know, while you're talking about the um, platform as a service, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you, yeah. you talked about you just taking care of, you, you decide the application you want to uh, use, the software, the program, uh, programming language, and the likes. However, I'd like to clarify, how about the network deployment, configuration topologies? You understand? Because if you decide how you want to run your application or your program, or you know the end result of what you want to get, certainly, since this is actually something that, you know, when you, I wouldn't know, I'm sure you still get to that part. When you're talking about the cloud computing, there are certain things that actually come as features, talking about computing, you talk about storage, you talk about, um, okay, let me just leave that to you. And if this works together, because your application will not work on its own, and the provider will not also decide totally in terms of configuration that is likely to meet certain commands or certain deliverables when you are doing your configuration, um, when you are doing your deployment in terms of the software or the programming language you want to use. I wouldn't know whether I made my, myself clear in terms of that question. So I needed to clarify that. Are you saying it is a provider that also takes care of your configuration topology, maybe in terms of uh, firewall rules, uh, what to allow, what not to allow, you understand? Because that goes squarely on that networking or on that computing. So I wouldn't know whether you get my question. Yes, yes, I, I got your question. So let, let me quickly um, respond to that, okay? So now in that instance, yes, the provider um, takes care of your networking. OK, now, if you want to take charge of your network, it's advisable you go with um, the infrastructure as a service. OK, if you want to take charge of your network, you want to decide your networking. Yeah, you can go with infrastructure as a service. But if you don't mind or you don't care about um, the network, for instance, you just want to come there and write your your, your codes and um, Bring your and and bring your code to to public view. Yes, um, you don't. Um, you can just use pass, for instance. And for pass, it is easier, in the sense that you just come there, select a language, for instance, and start deploy and start writing your code and deploy. But in an instance of infrastructure as a service, you need to have the infrastructure, which is the VM um, running, right? And when you have your VM running, you need to start installing the application stack, right? And when you install the application stack, you need to now start um, um, decide on which language um, to use. And you need to start installing uh, VS codes and, and all sorts, you understand? Now, in that, in that instance, um, PASS will have done all those things for you. You understand? Pass is just going to, you are just going to um, come to the language, get your URL, and um, get your, uh, write your codes, and um, you get your public, um, you get to, to provision it to a public um, view. Mm -hmm. So, yes, if you want to take charge of your network, you can use the IaaS, for instance. Yeah, you can still make use of IaaS as a programmer, but for, for easier, um, for easier, easier use, it's good that you go with pass. And if I'm to ask you, why do you want to go with IaaS as a developer? Because, you know, if you are talking about, if you are talking about the network, if you are talking about the network, the only thing you might, that might be of higher consideration to you will be the public IP, right? The public IP for you to, to use your virtual machine. And if you are talking about the, the security, okay, there are two parts to the security. There is a way to, my, Microsoft will have secured the infrastructure for you, but you can also secure your applications. You understand? There are two, two parts to the security there. There's a part to secure your node or your VMs, and there is a part to secure your application. Now, when you use PASS, Microsoft will secure the VM for you, only what you need to do is to secure your application. But if you are using infrastructure as a service, you are the one that will secure your infrastructure. At the same time, you need to secure your application. You understand? 
Understand? Okay, so your question, I, I'm just asking as an out of curiosity, and not yeah. primarily because I'm a developer. First and foremost, my first love and then my primary uh, job role, I'm a network and security person. You understand? So it was out of a second love that I'm actually uh, moving into development uh, environment. You understand? So, Okay, that, that's nice. Um, I think we can continue. Uh, I, I would say we should run through the slides, then we will come to question and answers later, right? Okay. okay, so let me quickly run through the slides, yeah. So if you have other questions, you can put it in the chat box. If you feel you are going to forget easily, we can um, put it in the chat box. We are going to trick them at the end of all, uh, at the end of this section, okay? Now, the core architectural component for Azure. Now, now when we talk about Azure, Azure deals with regions, okay? So when we talk about regions, regions are, in Azure, Azure is made up of data centers located around the globe, okay? Currently now, Microsoft, Microsoft has 54 regions. Microsoft has 54 regions, which means that they have data centers in 54 regions. Now, 54 regions doesn't mean 54 countries. Let's get that correctly. 54 regions doesn't mean 54 countries. It means 54 geographical areas, which means that in US, I can have two regions. In South Africa, I have two regions. In Europe, I can have one or six regions. It depends, you understand? So it's not based on countries is based on a geographical areas, okay? And in Microsoft, Microsoft currently has 54 regions currently. And why do we have those kind of regions? And why do, is this regions okay? Now, when you have those kind of regions, you know, Microsoft is connected using fiber connectivity. And imagine you having fiber connectivity running across 54 regions. It results to a low latency, okay? And when you have low latency, for instance, Nigeria is very close to West Europe. For instance, Microsoft and Nigeria has a close proximity to West Europe. So if I'm deploying any of my infrastructure in West Europe, I can easily or quickly deploy these applications because of the low latency. And those um, areas, those data centers are closer to my country, okay? Now, now, there are some special regions. Now, when we talk about special regions, there are some regions that Microsoft has provisioned um, for some countries. Uh, some countries have already informed Microsoft that you can't take data out of the country. For instance, Germany, you can't, in Germany, you can't take data out of Germany, okay? Which means that and their citizens can't deploy any infrastructure outside of Germany which means that anybody in Germany that needs to deploy a virtual machine or use a resources on Azure, they need to use it inside the country. So Microsoft has some special regions for government, for US government. So for US government, they can deploy their applications or deploy their infrastructure outside some specific data centers. So Microsoft builds some specific data centers for US government for China and for Germany. So I as a Nigerian, I can't I can't deploy a VM in Germany because um, based on their 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 compliance and um, based on the country law that you can they can't allow anybody from other citizens to deploy any VM in their regions and a citizen in their regions living in their country cannot deploy any application outside of Germany. The same thing happens to China, for, for, for instance, also. Yeah? Now, there's another part to region pair. Now, when we talk about region pair, now region pair, uh, re that it means that they can replicate um, their, their, their data centers in a particular region, in a particular geographical region. Now, let's say, for instance, I'm in Africa, for instance, um, there are some servers in Africa, in the asset data center in Africa, I, the South Africa uh, data center in Africa, and we have Dubai, for instance. 
Dubai is in East, uh, if I'm correct, um, is in, I forgot where it is anyway. <laughs> Dubai. So we have UAE. data United centers Arab in Emirates. UAE, yes. United Arab Emirates, thank you for that. So we have some data centers in Dubai, for instance. Now, the data center you have in South Africa replicates to the data center in Dubai because they are in the same geographical um, area. So in that instance, these are region pairs, okay? Now, which means that a, the, the replic there are replications going along the, between the servers in South Africa and the servers in Dubai. So in that instance, there are no service, in fast, in, in service interruption. Even if there are power outage or network outage in South Africa, for instance, people that are using that data center won't feel it because there are um, a replication going on the Azure resources in Dubai also. The same thing happens in US. US also has their own region pair. Europe has their own region pair. The North Americans has their own region pair. Australia has its own region pair, whereby Africa and the uh, Middle East has their own region pair. Now, the reason for doing that is because of natural disasters and in instances whereby there are power outage or network outages, okay? Now, geography, uh, geographically, uh, you can have more than one region, um, one region in a, in, in a country. For instance, in US, you can have, you have East US, you have West US, and you have Central US, okay, uh, in US. Okay, so these in these instances allow customers to specify some data residencies and compliances. Okay, and because of the close proximity, so let's say I'm living in US, for instance, I'm living in in East US, for instance. If I'm creating a VM or creating a, a resource, yeah, I can create my resource in West US. You understand? And uh, even though I'm in the US part of the country. Uh, because of the close proximity, I will hardly have um, data loss or have um, um, resource um, downtime because of the close proximities um, you have in those countries. So even if there are uh, natural disasters in East US, for instance, I can still have my resources in West US or have my resources in Central US, for instance. Now we could see that it's been categorized categorized into America, Europe, Asia, Pacific, Middle East, and Africa. Now, when we talk about availability zones, okay, so availability zones are like you are having your servers in different physical locations, okay? Now, so let's say for instance, like I explained earlier, I can have my deployment or my infrastructure running in West US. But as I'm having my infrastructure running in West US, if I'm specifying the availability zones, which by default it is three, by default uh, Microsoft um, can provide an availability zones for you, you can have your infrastructure or resources running in Europe, for instance, in France Central, for instance. Even if there are issues in America or in Central US, your resources or your services is still up and running. You still have your services running and there, are, there won't be any downtime, okay? So even if one availability zone goes down, if you see one availability zone, if it goes down, you still have your services running in any of these availability zones. So say for instance, this availability zone is Central US. This is in France and I have this in South Africa, for instance. So if anything goes wrong in the US, for instance, say natural disaster or power or any uh, natural disaster in US, for instance, I won't possibly have issues because I still have my services in this region, which is France Central, and in this other region, which is Central, which is South Africa, okay? Now, this is different from availability sets, okay? Now, what I explained here was availability zones, which means that you are taking your infrastructure across regions, across Microsoft Azure regions. 
But in this case, you are having your resources running in one data center. Okay, now let me explain this way. Now, in a data center, you can have different racks. For people that have visited um, data centers before, you, you will see different racks. And inside a rack, you will see nodes. You will see different nodes inside each rack, okay? And when you see each node inside each rack, for availability set, Microsoft ensures that your services is running across these nodes. Hello? Can you hear me? Huh? Okay. Can, can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Microsoft ensures... Okay, Microsoft ensures that you have all your resources running across each node. So I can have my resource running in node one and have my other resources running in node three and have my other resources running in, in node four, for instance. So let's say this is rack one, rack two, rack three. And this is node one, node two, node three, node four. Okay. Now, there are different comparisons. There are different, uh, it comprises of the fourth domains and the update domain. Now, when I talk of the fourth domain, these are physical separations of the workload, okay? So, which means that if a power goes down, let's say a power goes down here in the FDO one, sorry. Let's say a power goes down in this FDO one, okay? the power won't affect, possibly they are not connected to different power sources, okay? Since they are not connected to different power sources. Hello, am I audible? Am I clear enough? You are, you are. It's like somebody is music. Okay, yes, we can hear so you let's you. say I have, okay, so let's say I have a power issue on this rack, for instance, or on this rack, for instance, I can still get my services running on other racks because they are connected to different power sources, okay? They are connected to different power sources. So if they are connected to different power sources, so which means that you are making a physical separation of your workloads, a physical separation of your workloads. So if power goes down on rack one, rack two is not affected, rack three is not affected. Okay, so you, your services will still be running. Yeah, now for the update domain. Now, you know, for Microsoft or for most of um, data centers, they do um, weekly or they do planned updates, right? They do plan maintenance on their, on their infrastructure. Okay, now when you are doing planned maintenance and infrastructure, if it's not well managed, it can cause service downtime. Okay. Now, what Microsoft has done is you, they ensure that when you, are doing inf when you are doing updates, the updates is done horizontally. Now, the update domain is an horizontal mode. Remember, the fourth domain is a vertical mode. So this is a vertical mode, and this is an horizontal mode, right? So which means that if I have power outage, this server is down, right? but these servers and these servers are still running. And my resources on these servers are still up and running. I don't have issues. Now, in an instance of updates, okay? So this update, if I'm doing update on this node, Microsoft ensures that you do update based on each nodes. So if I'm doing update on this node one here, in this FD0, FD it won't go to FD1 until when the node here is up and running yes so when fd0 update is finished it goes to fd1 so at that point fd01 fd0 all the resources on fd0 is up and running so even if resources on fd01 which is node 1 so let's say this is node 0 node 0 node 1 node 2 node 3 so on fd1 node 0 for instance uh, you are doing update on it, it won't affect the FD2 node 0, for instance. Now, you need to finish the update on FD1 node 0 before it moves to FD2 node 0. So that is in an instance of update domain. And the way Microsoft has done it, Microsoft has made a default number. Microsoft has ensured that you have three default domains, 
which means that you will you will have three nodes. When I say fourth domain, I mean three nodes. For instance, you will have three nodes for each your each of your VMs, and you have twenty update domains. So with that, you are sure of an high availability set. Now, this is something Microsoft provides. Okay, Microsoft is the one that provides this. Now, in an instance where you have data loss or you have um, service loss, Microsoft can easily get back your services or your resources for you. Okay. Now, we have resource groups. Okay. Now, resource groups are like logical containers whereby you have all your resources in them. I'm going to demo all these things. You are going to see them, but I'm, I'm going to run through all the slides. So this is like a logical um, containers whereby you have all your resources inside them. So I can have my storage, my VM, my network, my IP, my subnet, uh, my VM itself running in a resource group. So it's more like a logical container. It doesn't have anything to do with your deployment. So which means that I can have my VM running in resource group one and have my storage account in a resource group two. You can do that, but it's not, you can't easily manage your resources. So for easy, easy management of your resources, it's good that you put all your resources in each resource group. So if I'm creating a VM, for instance, I need to ensure that all my resources are in one resource groups, okay, for easy management. Now for resource ARM, now this is called Azure Resource Manager, for instance, okay. So for the Azure Resource Manager, uh, it, it, it flows down in an hierarchy, okay. So you have a management group, which is more like um, the top hierarchy, at the top hierarchy. And for the management group, you have subscription. After the subscription, you have resource groups. And after the resource group, you have resources. Okay, this is the, the hierarchy, the management layer for any of your ARM. So if I have multiple subscriptions, I can have each resource group running for each subscription, and I can have my resource group running in my resource group. So the way it works, I have a resource, I have a subscription. Let's say I have one subscription, for instance, I will deploy, I will have a resource group running in my subscription. And after having a resource group running in my subscription, I will have resources running in my resource group. Now, yeah, in, in an instance whereby you have multiple subscription, you have one, more, more than one subscription. And why will you have more than one subscriptions? There are different reasons. Some can have more subscription because uh, more than one subscription because they want each department to ask its own subscription. Some can have different subscriptions because they want to have it for each of their location. So let's say I have my office in Lagos, I have another office in Port Harcourt, I have another offices in, in, in Abuja, for instance. Some customers can decide to have for each location, each, each subscription, okay? Now, if I need to manage this subscription, I need to now create something called a management group. Now, the management group is the one that will control all the resource group, all the subscriptions that I have, okay? Now, there are some core Azure services and, pro and products. I hope we are still on time. Are we still keeping to time? Yeah. Okay, now for the Azure, um, compute system. We have Azure Compute System. Now, Azure Compute System is mo mostly related to IaaS. In an instance of that, you provision your resources, you provision disk, processors, memory, networking, operating system, and your resources are charged based per minute or per seconds. And what are the common demands you have? You have virtual machines and containers, for instance. I'm going to explain containers in a, in a little bit, but uh, you can have virtual machines and containers for the Azure compute system. And for the Azure compute system, you have Azure VMs, you have VM skill sets, you have app services, and you have functions. Okay, these are VM services. Now for Azure VM, like these are like you are creating a VM on Azure, okay? 
I'm creating a VM on Azure, that is Azure VM, for Azure VM skill set. Now look at it in an instance for auto scaling of identical VMs. Let's say, for instance, you I'm, I'm working for Jumia, for instance. Now, Jumia knows that every Christmas, there are influx of sales, or every Valentine, there are influx of sales. Now, the ideal thing for them to do is they, they need to plan to that day. So they know that possibly starting from December 28th or December 21st, there will be a lot of people that will be um, that will need um, um, to buy on their platform, okay? So what they can do is they can say, okay, because we understand that there will be a lot of rush and there will be rush um, for, on, on people getting our, to, to buy, um, to subscribe and, and, um, and for people to buy from our platform, they can decide to increase their VMs, okay? They can say instead of we having two VMs, we are going to increase it to five VMs, for instance. So when they increase to five VMs, you know, people won't have issues like complaining like, oh, this website is slow. Yeah. Oh, I can't easily connect to this, um, web to this website. So they can plan ahead and say, okay, I'm going to give 10 VMs around this period. So when they give 10 VMs around this period and people can easily um, go on Jumia and, um, and, and um, buy whatever they want to buy, you understand? But on Azure Compute Server on services, Microsoft with this VM skill set, Microsoft is going to automatically do it for you. So it's not like you will be going there to now start creating the VMs yourselves. It will become a problem for you going there yourself and create it. So with this VM skill set, it will automatically create the VM for you. Okay. And when it discovers that there are less people um, demanding for uh, or less people connecting to this services it will scale down to two so it's more like something that is shrinking and when you discover there are there are influx of load it will automatically increase that is for the vm skill set i believe you understand now for app services app services are like platform as a service now like i explained earlier you can build your web or mobile or api application on on azure okay and in that instance, you'll be needing an app services to build a web, mobile, and an API application. Okay, now to build a web, mobile, and API application, you'll be needing an app services, okay? Now, there is something called a function. Now, a function is similar to app, app, app services. But the difference between function and app services is it creates infrastructure based on triggers. Based on triggers. Now, let's, let's look at it in this instance. Let's say I developed a website called um, Learn Azure in, um, in Moonlight.com, for instance. I created a website, Learn Azure in Moonlight.com. We created a website, for instance. Now, with function, is going to, when you create a function, it's going to be looking at triggers. So, which means that the VM will automatically shut down, the application will automatically shut down. Now, when it discovers that um, people is about to connect, it will, the application will, will come up on itself. You understand? So, let's say, for instance, my application, nobody is accessing my application between 1 a.m. to 5 a.m., for instance. The application will shut down more like it will it will more like shut down you understand and when when people start connecting let's say from 8 a.m and people connect to that application it automatically comes up now the reason why you can have that is you can you can um it's for cost optimization you can reduce cost with this function especially for web developers okay so i can when you have app services Either you are using it or you are not using it, you are, you are being charged, okay? Now, for functions, you are only be charged based on the trigger you are having on your application. You understand? So if there are no triggers on your application, it means you are not going to be charged. So if I'm not, nobody is accessing my, my application between 1 a.m. and 5 a.m., for instance, 
I won't be charged. But let's say someone, people are beginning to access my application from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. I will only be charged between that 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. But for app services, is a 24 hours, um, somewhere, it's a 24 hours model. Either people are connecting or they are not connecting. People, you will get, you be, be charged. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I'm a little bit slow. I need to get, I need to go a little bit faster. Now we have Azure subscriptions. So, okay, like I explained, now Azure subscriptions provide authentication and authorization of access to your Azure product and services. For you to use any Azure, you need to have Azure subscription. Without Azure subscription, you can't deploy or you can't um, access any Azure product and services. Now there are free and paid subscription options you can have, okay? And um, okay, I think I've explained this. The management group, I've explained this. Okay, so you can have a management group and have subscriptions and have resource groups um, across the management group. Okay. Now these are the hierarchies. I think I've explained this also. Now, now you can create free Azure subscription. Okay, uh, I'm going to demo that. How to create a free Azure subscription. For people that want to create a free Azure subscription, okay, and um, you have 200 USDs, US $200 for 30 days. So it's going to be $200 for 30 days. But however, you will have 12 months of free services, okay. You can have, you have 30 days um, for subscription, but you have 12 months for free services, okay. And what are the factors that can affect your cost? You have resource type the services and the location. What it means by that is if I have some application, the application I deploy is in West Europe can be cheaper than the application I would deploy in Central US, for instance. And it depends on the services you are running, okay, and the resource type also. These are something that can affect your cost. Okay, so I'm going to demo um, creation of VM. Um, let me quickly demo that. So let me see if you can see my, my screen. I'm going to start with the Azure portal and I'm going to try to demo the creation of Azure VM. Okay, um, I would just keep our mind to this. Sorry, I would our mics. Hello, can we please mute our mic? Thank you very much. Okay, so I believe we can see my screen, right? Please that now. Okay, we can see that. Okay, now, now we are going to create a free Azure subscription. I'm just going to show you how to create a free Azure subscription. I'm not going to create one. Okay, now free trial. Okay, now to create a free Azure subscription, you just need to go to this website, azure.microsoft.com slash engb slash free. Okay, I hope my internet is free. I click on start for free. Okay, um, I hope my internet is going to be cooperating at this time. Okay, so as this is coming up, let me quickly show us the Azure portal. Okay, um, this is still coming up. I'm just going to quickly show us the Azure portal. Okay, let me sign out. This is my work account. Let me sign out. Uh, okay, let me use a different account. Uh, okay, let me do this again. This is possibly connecting to my work um, account. Let me quickly, I'm going to quickly show us the Azure portal. I'm going to come back to the free, um, the free subscription.
So I know a lot of people are familiar with the Azure portal, but I just want to show this for people that possibly they are seeing this for the first time and um, um, they don't really understand a lot of what is here, okay? Now, now when you have your Azure, this is how the portal looks like, okay? Basically, this is how the, what the portal looks like. Now, in the next one, three months, it might be different from what you are seeing because the portal can keep changing, okay? So, but it's still the same services. It's still the same um, um, services you, you have, okay? Now, I can come here. So from here, I have my blades. This is what they call the blade. Now, this is resource groups. This is my all resources, every of my resources. This is app services. This is subscription. This is SQL database. This is Azure Cosmos DB, which is similar to, which is for the SQL database also. This is my VM. This is load balancer, storage account, a lot of things I have here, okay? Now, if I'm to create a VM, let me create a VM, okay? I'm gonna come to create a resource. There are different ways, create a resource, okay? Now I can select, I can say see all, for instance. Now there are different. Ways. Know what you are looking for. This is what they call a marketplace. Now, this is how is this? I believe you can still see my screen, right? Yes. Yes, we can see. Okay, so this is what we call get like app for hello. Hello. Can you see okay? So I want to create a virtual machine. So I would just possibly write virtual machine. Click enter. So I'm not gonna create a VM, but I'm just gonna show you how to create a virtual machine. For instance, okay, um, this is taking time. Oh, okay, nice. So, okay, now uh, I talked about skill set the other time. I don't know if you can still see my screen. So, this is yeah. skill set. This is skill set. This is the VM skill set. If I want to create a skill set, I click on it and I create a skill set. But I want to, I just want to create a Windows, um, uh, a Windows VM. So let's say I need, I know what I'm looking for, Windows Server 2016. I want to create a Windows Server 2016 VM, for instance. Oh, okay. Uh, Windows Server. Okay, I can create a Windows Server this way. So I want to create a Windows Server 2016 data, data set. Okay. I hope my internet is strong enough. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, now this is how to create a VM. This is what you see. Okay, now you firstly, the first thing you need to do is to specify your subscription. My subscription, I have a subscription, so I'm using this is my subscription. Now, another thing you need to do is to have a resource group. Like I said, resource groups are like logic control. I can also specify a resource group. So, so I can create a resource group and say uh, 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 Azure um, Moonlight, for instance. Let's say this is my resource 
by credit group. It looks at it if it's available. Yes, it's available. I click on that. Okay. Now I can specify my VM name. So this means you can say, um, I can give it a name Moonlight One Azure Moonlight. For instance, okay. And uh, another thing, you need to specify the now the best way to specify region is to look at which of these regions is closer to you, it's closer to where you are. Now I'm in Nigeria, so West Europe is closer to me than East Europe or than West US. So I specified West Europe for instance. Now I know availability is... option. I discussed availability option the other time. Hello, can you still see my slides? My my screen? Can yes. anyone still yeah, see my can... screen? Yeah we can see it now. Okay. Now the availability option I can decide which of my availability options either availability zones or availability set. Like I have explained earlier, availability zones are I'm crossing my I'm taking my resources across regions. Okay. And availability set, all my resources is residing in a data center. That is the difference between availability zones and availability set. So look at it in an instance whereby I have my resources across regions. I can have some in I have my resources replicated across regions. Replication replicated across regions and for availability set I have my my resources replicated in a data center or in a part in what in just one region I can have my resources replicated inside so I can specify which one but I'm not going to specify it for this demo okay now I can pick my image so this image I'm picking is Windows Server 2016 data center I can pick any other ones I, I can pick Ubuntu Red Hat Oracle, Windows Server 2019, Windows Server 2012, Windows 10 Pro, I can pick anything. And even if I'm looking for an image here, I can't find them. I can browse. It will give me all the images and I can select any of these images. Okay? I can select any of these images. It could be a custom images. It could be um, some images being provided by partners like Barracuda, Barracuda is a firewall device, like Barracuda or Citrix uh, or uh, Oracle or Kali Linux or Red Hat. I can pick any image or NetApp. I can pick any image I want, okay? But for this demo, I will be using Windows Server 2016. Now, for the Azure Spot instance, okay? So the Azure Spot instance is an instance whereby you you can you, you are not being charged for what you are using okay so if i'm to click yes yes yeah it means i will be charged based on my resource my my my, um, my vms okay so if i'm deploying let's say i, I deallocate a vm for instance if i'm deallocating a vm now if it's pinning up the vm again it's going to be going to the same node i don't know whether we understand now, you know, for nodes, inside a node, you have your VMs. Now, if I'm to deallocate a VM, which means I'm stopping a VM, normally it should speak any available nodes and have your VM inside there. But in an instance where I click on yes, it means anytime I'm restarting my VM, it will always go to that Absolutely. specific node. You understand? But I don't need that at this demo, okay? Now, I can pick my size. So for the size, it deals with your CPU, your RAM, your IOPS, your, uh, your temporary storage, okay? And there are different methods to this. You can have a general purpose VM. You can have other, other, other VMs. You can have G GPU. You can have high performance compute, computer optimized, memory optimized, storage optimized. You can have different um families you can have different set of purposes now the different the reason why you have this different set of purposes hello can you see me hello yes hello. You can hear you. okay the reason why okay. you have different set of purposes because of the workload now say for instance i'm working in a factory that um, they deal with high 
compute system or I'm a graphic designer or uh, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm a person that works with a lot of graphics, for instance, or I'm an architect or a builder that builds, um, um, that, that, that draws architectural drawing or even a game developer that develops games. You know, you, you, you need some very high compute system. Okay, so from the family, I can select um, either an high performance compute. It's going to look at it and say, okay, this is going to be a recommendation for you. Okay, it's going to recommend um, the best um, family you can, the, the best VM size you can have that will ensure that you have your services run. Hello, 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 everyone. Hello, yeah, hello. Back. yeah, sorry, my network got disconnected. Um, I'm not sure we're okay. going to be able to finish this slide because I'm looking at the time and I know a lot of us, uh, we have a lot of things we need to do. Um, yeah, okay. I, I think we're, I, we're going to possibly stop here. We're going to reschedule another day um, during this week or next week um, to continue, okay? But I'm going to create a VM. We are going to show us how to create a VM. And we might stop there, take questions, and we'll continue from where we stop, OK? And um, possibly That's next good. week, OK? OK, That's good. Yeah. OK, so please, can you still That's see my good. screen? That's it. Nice. OK, yes, yeah. we can see it. OK, so I can, I can have my admin name. So this is going to be the, the, the username you are going to be used to log on to your VM. So I can say um, test VM, test admin, for instance. Okay, I can specify my password as password if I want to. Okay, um, I need a lower case, upper case. I can say pass one word, word, and I can create a, I can confirm the password also pass one world, okay? Now I can specify my port. Okay, so you need to open some ports, okay? Microsoft is more like a closed system. They ensure that they closed all ports. So if you want to deploy a VM, you need to create a port. You need to enable some ports, okay? I'm not sure this, my password is, okay, they said 12 characters. Okay, uh, I need to write a 12 character. I think that is up to 12. Let me do that again. Okay, so yeah. So I'm going to open a port, okay? So I'm, because this is a VM, and I want to add a bit of the VM, I will be, open, I will be opening 3389. If obviously it's a Linux VM, I'll be opening port 22. If I need to um, do a web um, deployment or web application, I need to open HTTP port 80, and for the HTTPS, I need to open port 443, okay? But in this instance, I will only be opening port 3389. Yes, now for bring license, so you can bring your license to Azure. Uh, if you have uh, a license, you can bring it. 
Now, when you bring your license, you have 49% off of your uh, your bill. So when Microsoft is going to be billing you, you'll be having 49% off. But if you don't have a license, you just pick no and go to the next slide. Now, going to the disk. Now, you need to specify a disk size, okay? The disk type. I have different disk type. I have the standard HDD. I have the standard SSD. I have the premium SSD, okay? Now, standard HDD, you know, when we talk of HDD, HDD are like their magnetic disk, okay? They are uh, most like our normal disk, uh, the normal disk we use uh, that has um, spins. And um, these, they, they can, they, they, the performance for HDD is lower because of the mechanical uh, movement of some of these, um, um, up or, um, the things running inside the disk. You know, so with that, the performance is a little bit lower. But for SSD, SSDs are something like similar to your flash, or similar to your uh, yeah to your to your to your flash or memory card. Okay, that those are like premium uh, premium SSDs, and those in those instances, their um, their performance is high. Okay, and when we talk about standard, standard means that you pay for what you use. So if I'm picking standard, I'm only paying for those disk size I'm using. So if I'm deploying a 200 gig disk, okay, if I'm specifying a disk of 200 or 100 gig, and I make use of 20 gig, I will only be paying for that 20 gig. That is for the standard. But if I'm picking premium, even if I'm to use one gig out of the 100 gig, I'll be paying for the whole 100 gig. Do you understand? I'll be paying for the old on this Android disk. I can attach a data disk, okay? And when you're talking about attaching data data disk, look at it in an instance whereby you are attaching disk and you're having E drive, F drive, G drive, H drive. You understand? So I can attach a um, new disk, or if I have an existing disk, I can attach the disk, okay? And I can select a managed disk or not. So if I said a managed disk, it means Microsoft is the one that will be managing my disks for me. Microsoft will manage the disks for me. But if I'm clicking no, I'm the one that will be managing the disk myself. Okay, that is the difference between managed disk and unmanaged disk. Now I go to the networking part. So to the network part, you can specify your virtual network, okay? So I can say I want my VM in 192.168 network, and I can create my network, okay? And I, I, I create a virtual network in that, uh, in that network. I create a VNet, and I specify a subnet. For this instance now, this is a 10.0 network. So you could see that from the subnet here, I have 10.0.2.0 slash 24 network, okay? Which means that any VM I'm creating it will be in this subnet, okay? Now, for the public IP, I can specify a public IP. Microsoft is going to be provisioning or providing a public IP for me in this instance, okay? And if I don't want, I can say I don't want a public IP, and I said no, okay? Now, I can specify a NIC NSG. And for the NIC NSG, uh, like I said earlier, you can specify some ports, okay? I can say I want to open some ports. I want to open port 3389. I don't want to open port 22. I want to open port 80. I don't want to open port 443. That is for that is what they call NSG, Network Security Group. Okay, so I can open ports. In the same thing for public ports also. Okay, now from the network, from the management Sorry, part, can you the remote control. Um, Dashboard, maybe you put it on the side, it's blocking some parts. Some I should remote control what is it? Is the screen open? Can you see my screen well? Is it okay? Hello, hello, can we all hear me? Hello, yes, yes, yes. hello. Can hear you. Can hear you. Okay, okay. Let me let me quickly run through this because I think we are we are we are we are we have spent a lot of time. 
Ah, uh, okay. So now I have boot diagnostics and OS guest diagnostics and then uh, identity and auto shutdown. I can specify the time. I can say my VM should be shutting down 7 p.m. every day, like I've specified here. So my VM will be shutting down 7 p.m. every day. Even if I forget, my VM will automatically shut down and it will send a mail to me that my VM is about to shut down because I've sent a notification here that if my VM is about to shut down, it should send me a notification. So it will send a notification to my email address that my VM is about to shut down by 7 p.m., okay? Now, for backups, I can enable backup for VM, okay? So to the advanced settings, yeah, I can set extensions, okay? So extensions are like, um, you can do a post deployment configuration uh, automation. So I can have um, some set of things being done inside the VM. For instance, I can reset my, my instance or my VMs. I can install application. I can install antivirus. I can install um, anything with an extension. I'm not going to go through this route, but we, we can also always check it. I can install uh, extensions uh, in, in this in these instances here. Yeah. Okay. Now, for cloud init, cloud init is more like for the Linux. Okay. So cloud init, when you need to install packages for Linux, um, especially for the first time you want to run, you want to boot your VM in for Linux. You can you can um, do or write some cloud init languages, and it will install some packages for you. Instead of you having your VM running and installing packages, you can have your cloud in it, um, run your, have your packages on cloud in it and run it. So what it means that when you are in, when you are installing your VM, those packages too will come up or will 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 be deployed or will 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 be installed as your VM two is installing. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, we can always check this ourselves. Can now I, can for I tags. Keep jumping and clarify something. Okay, sure. Okay, yeah, you mean um, the cloud in its function under the advanced is actually like a package that is attached to a Windows VM, right? But it's just that it's it's uh, you are able to use it for um, um, Linux uh, packages. Is that what you mean? Okay. No, cloud in it only works for Linux VMs. Only for Linux. Okay. Okay. Yes. Now the the the, the thing that the synonyms to, to to that is the extension. Extension here works for for Windows. Why that cloud in it works for Linux? Linux. Okay. Yes. And the extension here works for VM. So for instance, let's say I want to install an antivirus. Let's say I want to install a a, a an Avast or uh, antivirus or Bit Defender antivirus. Instead of me creating my VM and start going inside the VM and install the antivirus, I can specify the extension for the antivirus, which is the Bit Defender, have it here. Now what it means is at the point of creating that VM, the Bit Defender antivirus is also being installed as my VM is installing. Okay. For the Linux VM, I can have a package. Let's say um, I want to run a Python uh, application on my Linux VM, for instance. Linux applications have some dependencies, have some packages you need to install first, okay? So I can write, I can have my cloud in it. I can have those languages or those dependencies um, with those commands on cloud in it, okay? So what it means is as my VM is creating, as I'm creating my VM, those, those packages too are being created as my VM yeah. is created. But the more the specified, because you are the one that knows what you want to actually achieve, right? Uh, yes, yes. So you need to now pick a package or you need to, to, to write the codes or the commands for those packages and it will install as the VM is installing, okay? Now for tags, no, tags are like, um, yeah, someone is going to take, um, so I, I know someone is going to be taking this section possibly tomorrow or day tomorrow. Um, yeah, so he might be talking a little bit about tax, but I'm just going to explain a little about tax. Okay, so tax are like, you can do a name and a value pair. What I mean by name and value pair, you can use that to categorize your resources. Okay, and you can categorize it based on who is spending the most. You can categorize it in point of department. I can say, okay, I 
have this department running this VM. So I will tag it. This VM is for finance. I'm tagging it for them. This VM is for IT. I'm tagging it for them. This VM is, is in production. I'm tagging it to, to that. This VM is in testing. I'm tagging it to that. So it's for easy management. So if you want to now manage your VMs, you want to know, okay, my VM that is running in finance, how much is, you can even use it for your cost management. How much um, is people in, in, in admin or in finance, how much are they spending on their VMs? People in IT, how much are they spending on their VMs? So you can specify that with the names and values. So I can create a name of, um, I can say the name is um, IT, and I say the value is, um, um, let's say, um, or I can say the name is department, for instance, department, and I say the value is IT, for instance. So what it means is, this VM I'm creating is tagging it to the IT department, okay? So after that, I'm going to review, it validates what I have, and it creates the VM, okay? Now, I'm not going to create the VM. This is how to just create a VM. As simple as that, I click on create, and it creates the VM. But I'm not going to create a VM here, because it's going to take our time. I'm just going to go to a VM I've created, and I'm going to show us um, some little thing here. Okay, now, this, when okay. you create a VM, what? this is what you will have. Okay, yeah, you want to ask something? Yes, uh, while you were actually uh, um, going through the VM uh, setup, and uh, you got to mm -hmm. extension, right? Yes. Um, you know, remember while, while you were taking the class, you started with three different types of cloud computing, all right? Which, which yeah. covers high mm -hmm. WAS, PWAS, and then S WAS, you understand? Um, IRS, yeah. uh, PASS, and SAS. Now, is there any amongst the three of them that does not actually require you having to do the role of having to uh, uh, provide extension? I think I should know the answer myself. That solely will have to be the SAS, right? That means everything that you will ever need would actually be, be automatically put configure for you it's just for you to use it right okay yeah sas yes now and okay, um, now, you can, it's also sorry. applicable to pass also oh, okay it's also applicable to pass pass also yes okay so because that means in the case of uh, iw in the case of iw uh, so assuming you are specifying your extensions Let's say it's actually on the software part now, like, for instance, an antivirus. So who bears the license? At that instance, you're actually installing or you're specifying the type of antivirus you want to use. Would that be charged into the particular platform of Azure you are running on, or you will need to install that as a third-party license? Okay, so there are two methods to that. Okay, so there, is, there are one whereby um, Microsoft are the ones that owns them, and there are ones oh. that they are third party. You understand? So the ones that Microsoft owns them, obviously, um, as you are get, being get built, you'll be, you'll be built um, from, as you are creating your VM. Now, for the third party, um, you might get built differently. You understand? So let's say I want to install a Sophos antivirus, for instance. Now, if I'm getting an extension of a Sophos antivirus, I need to possibly get a license of a Sophos antivirus and um, and um, put the, the license in my in my extension. So with that, I, I need to pay for the license from from um, from Sophos. Okay. Now, uh, this is the last thing I'll be doing today. Uh, well, I'm going to try to schedule another date to next week if we could continue. But this is where I'm going to stop today because our time is fast spent, okay? Now, okay, so this is everything you will see when you create your VM. You will see overview, activity log, and uh, access control tags, network, connect, disk, size, security. Now, these are what you will have, okay? Now, these are what you can use to monitor your VM. Inside, it will look down in, inside your VM. I'm just going to explain a little, a little on all these things, and we are going to be going now. Inside, it will be going deep into your VM, 
and make some um, some recommendations to you. So if there are things whereby you need to change your password because your password is vulnerable, uh, instead of creating a strong password, you are creating a weak password. Insight is going to specify all those that, all, all those things for you. For alert, you are, you are creating alert. For instance, like I, the one I did, um, every 7 p.m., I should always get alert that my VM is about to, to stop, okay? And for metrics, metrics are like um, you are getting a graphical um, display of your, your, your resources, how you are consuming your resources. Look at it the way uh, performance monitor works for people that are conversant with Windows 7 or Windows 10. The way PEF, in, PEF, monitor, PEF performance monitor works, that's the same way um, man, metrics works, okay? Now, for, com, for connection monitor, connection monitors are like you can monitor your connections. You can monitor your, your ports. You can monitor your, your port numbers. And in an instance whereby the ports are not communicating, you can use this, com, this connection monitor to troubleshoot. Okay, let me move a little bit upward here. Now, we have networking. Networking are like um, the VNet, the, star, the subnet. Um, you have them in the networking, okay? But they connect. You can connect uh, to, to either using RDP or Bastion. Now, Bastions are like, um, uh, they are like um, dedicated, um, how will I say? They are like dedicated um, way of, of logging into your VM. Okay, now you know you can log into your VM using RDP, but in an instance whereby yeah, you want to use something like stuff. a jump, a jump box, you want to use a jump box. You don't want it. Uh, you don't want to give a public IP to your VM so that um, you log onto the VM. You can use a bastion, and with the bastion, it creates a jump box for you. From the jump box, you can connect to the VM. Okay, so with that, it's more secured using bastion than using RDP. Now for the disk, I've explained the disk. For the size, I've explained the size. Now, extensions is what I was explaining earlier. I can add extensions. Like I said, there are some extensions that have been owned by Microsoft, and there are some extensions that they are third-party uh, extensions. Okay, yeah, you could see from here, there is a Microsoft anti-malware extension here. So this is a Microsoft extension. But look at this. I have an ESET file security. ESET is a third-party uh, application. Kapersky is a third party um, application. So when I install these extensions, let's say Kapersky for instance, I install this extension, I'll be charged by Kapersky. Okay. Uh, I need to get license for this Kapersky. Um, and then you need to pay for the license. Okay. And Kapersky is the one that you need to buy the license from Kapersky, not from Microsoft. Okay. That's for the extension. Uh, identity. Okay. Um, that is how to log in. You can use your Azure identity um, to log in. Now, lock. For lock here, I'm just picking it because we, are, we have run out of time, okay? For lock here, in an instance whereby you don't want anybody to delete your VM, you want to lock it down so that in instance someone wants to mistakenly um, delete your resources. So when you lock it, um, nobody can mistakenly delete your resources, okay? So there are a lot of things you have here. Uh, I'm, I'll, I'll be stopping here because I discovered our time is fast spent. And um, I know a lot of us have a lot of things we need to do. Yeah. So I don't know if any of us have a question. I, I will schedule another time next week um, that we can possibly have a, a, a section. Okay. Do we have any question? I'll be stopping here. Uh, I will continue um, possibly next week. Thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks. Great presentation. Uh, you really talked about uh, the Azure from the beginning, though, because of the time, uh, I know uh, you can schedule it for next week, but I'm looking at it from the perspective that since this is a day-to-day -day, uh, learning process, uh, I don't yeah. know when, when, when this will continue again, because I don't want us to stop in the middle of, of this thing, because it is very interesting. Thank you. Okay, so like I said, you know, um, what we are doing is we are we are scheduling um, weekly. Okay, the way we are scheduling our trading is weekly. So we can still pick a particular day next week. It could be next week Monday, it could be next week Tuesday, and we will continue from where we stopped. 
we've already scheduled all this week. We have somebody that will be presenting tomorrow. We have somebody that will be presenting on Friday up on up till on Sunday. You understand? But when we are drafting our our schedule for next week, uh, we can uh, we can um, possibly schedule another day. So that can be um, getting started at two, for instance. So, okay, thanks. But if you have to continue in the in the, if you have to continue this way in the next two three hours, you might not finish. And you know, a lot of us needs to 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 get back to to what we are doing to our daily activities. You know. Okay, thanks. Then, so, do we have, do we have... If, if it is then possible, probably you could do um, a kind of quick survey to see when we could have um, a ramp up to this class because I should think that. It's meant to serve as uh, a basis for the next class or for the other classes that have been scheduled. As a matter of fact, I won't lie to you, I've actually done a lot on, on my own. That's why I could really be asking you some technical questions. Like I've done, gone so far with our job because I have an account with uh, Microsoft Learn. You understand? And I've done about 50-something um, um, courses or more with about six badges and like stuff like that achievement and there are still things that the way you are taking it you are being part of that like i'm limited i couldn't really demo certain things for instance i do not have an account to use there are some places where i really wanted to like look at run some command and all that see what's going to be like i want to run some app services and stuff like that you know and i couldn't continue and it was like um a discouragement for me so if Running through this class, some things are clarified. I want to really just go back and then personalize. Then I will have reason for why I want to spend. Like, okay, if I want to do um, paid subscription, because we all need to know that Azure, if you don't have an active account, even the free one, there are certain limitations you have. So that's that. If it's possible, though, we can do a survey. Let's see whether we can have the class at and maybe another time this week outside of the scheduled class. Prior to your next class next week, I don't know if that's possible. Well, that is open to the house uh, to decide that. Uh, if they want that, yeah, I'm available. But also, you need to know that I'm also working from home, and uh, I have some other deliverables <laughs> that I need to to <laughs> to okay. ensure that um, I got them delivered. I'm, okay. I'm locked down in the office. I'm at the office. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, but, but but I think it's not a bad idea. Uh, we are still going to possibly schedule next week. Um, I'm going to pick a particular day next week. We'll continue from where we stopped. Uh, someone is going to be presenting tomorrow on Azure policies, if I'm correct. And um, uh, I, I should have talked a little about the Azure policy, but I know that tomorrow is going to deep dive more and talk about the Azure policy. And you know, the beautiful thing about this is when they do their presentation, when I'm coming back to my own presentation, which is the basics, we already have a good understanding of um, some of these things. So coming down to the basics, we will know how to, to um, um, ask a question or, or direct our energy well when asking questions. Okay. So I want to thank everyone. So tomorrow is Thursday. Uh, we've scheduled a call for tomorrow to for 6.30 p.m. Okay, so the topic is going to be Azure policy and cost management. Okay, um, Azure policy and cost management. There is a way, uh, I, I don't know. I need to show this to people. For people that don't know that Microsoft is collaborating with Pluralsight. You can get great videos from Pluralsight, um, great Azure videos on Pluralsight. I'm going to look for that. Um, we're going to look for that link. I will share it. Um, you can register on Pluralsight. You have wonderful videos from a lot of authors. Um, if you have Night of last need day. some good, good, good knowledge about Azure. Okay. Yeah. So, like I said, uh, we'll be continuing this. Um, section tomorrow. I don't want us to to go beyond one hour, one hour plus, because I know that a lot of us we need to go back to what we are doing, and um, and um, you know I, I just feel that we we should always have one hour um, training or section on Azure 
every day one hour, every day one hour, up till when we, the coronavirus or pandemic ends, okay? So we'll be having a section tomorrow by 6.30. I will want us to join 6.30 p.m. on the dot so that we can quickly get this thing done, okay? And uh, it, won't be, it won't be as this late tomorrow. So the person will be presenting on our job policy and cost management, okay? And his name is Uche. Hello? Okay, and the person's oh, okay. name is Uche. Uche. So I want to thank everyone. Um, if you have questions and worries, you can put it in the group chat. And I know there are a lot of people in the group chat um, that will respond to your questions. Okay. I want to thank everyone um, for this. I hope there are no other questions. Where can we have the slides? Um, I can provide the slides to you as soon as I'm done. That's fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.